welcome everybody to this um, hybrid uh, Max Weber and Democracy Cluster Seminar to discuss um, Til, Til Van Raden's um, recent book. Uh, I should say it's a particular pleasure for two reasons. One is that I've known um, Till for 10 years now, and we are, um, and if we were all here and we had a cocktail afterwards, like we would explain to you why, we consider ourselves fellow survivors, but that's for another time when we're all in person. Um, but it's also a great pleasure because I think certainly from my own um, point of view, it's the first time I have uh, been with an invited speaker in person for well over a year, uh, certainly for whole, the whole of 2021 and I think arguably for the whole of 2020, so it's, a, so it's a real pleasure. I'm not going to say very much, I'm just going to introduce the speakers um, very quickly to give everyone a bit more time. So um, let me first introduce Till van Raden, who um, teaches history at the University of Montreal. Um, and he is the author of the book, A Democracy, A Fragile, you seem to be precise that you want it to be translated in English as a fragile way of life. Um, and he's going to speak for around 10 minutes about his uh, book and why he wrote it. And then we will be followed by um, four people, all of whom have a direct um, association with the EUI. First of all, Elias Buchetman, who is from the um, history department and who recently received his PhD um, from history. So those of you who are still doing a PhD who know it can be done. So welcome, Elias. It's nice to see you. I'm sorry we can't see you in person. He is going to be followed by Caroline or Carolyn, um, either Lerch or Lerch, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, um, who is in the, who's a researcher in the SD, SPS department. Um, no, Law Department. Oh, sorry, I thought he was a, apologies, Law Department. Anyway, welcome, you're very welcome. Um, and then um, here in person, um, uh, who you will see is Tommaso Milani, who is from the History Department and is a postdoc Max Weber fellow. Um, and last but not least, um, Ben O'Gamel, who has recently arrived in the um, History Department and is the Chair of Gender and Sexuality. Without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Till. Till. So thank you uh, so much, Lucy, for, for bringing me here, for introducing me, uh, and for putting together such, such an amazing group of people to comment on uh, my book. Um, I'm, I'm particularly intrigued to be here because one of the key inspirations of, of the book is Niccolo Machiavelli. So perhaps in the distant future, an inter interdisciplinary program at the European University Institute uh, will not be named after somebody from Erfurt, the famous city of Erfurt, but with have, we'll have a bit of a local flavor. The, the other thing I want to mention um, before we delve into democratic theory is that post-war Italy, at least to somebody like me who is at once drawn and irritated by Anglophone mainstream political theory, um, post-war Italy is a peculiar place because people like Noberto uh, Bobbio or Danilo Zolo um, draw on interwar political traditions in interesting ways that you will not find in post-war Germany. So an interest in the work of Hans Kilsen that is now uh, almost can, can be found in a lot of places is somebody, something that marks post-war Italian political and democratic theory from the get-go. And that's sort of an absence in the case of post-war Germany as a contrast. So um, I think there's, there's something to be said about Florence as, as, as a site for such conversations. Uh, but let me briefly summarize um, the key arguments of the book. So what happens when we understand democracy not simply as a matter of elections and political parties, laws and parliaments? How shall we conceptualize the social and cultural foundations of democracy? How significant are quotidian experiences of equality and freedom for the viability of liberal democracies? 
Such questions were articulated most pointedly by American political thinkers, such as Walt Whitman. According to the poet, democracy was above all a way of life. Did you too, oh friend, suppose democracy was only for elections, for politics, and for a party name? He asked his readers only to answer unequivocally, I say democracy is only of use there that it may pass on and come to its flower and fruits in manners, in the highest forms of interaction between men and their beliefs, in religion, literature, colleges, and schools, democracy in all public and private life, and in the army and in the navy. Just as the feudal order had shaped the politics, society, architecture, and culture of its age, the quote, democratic principle would affect the quote, moral, aesthetic, social, political, and religious expressions and institutes of the civilized world. I invoke Whitman's essay on democratic vistas, originally written against the background of the Civil War, the darkest moment in the history of the American Republic, as an antidote to the sense of despair that informs recent conversations about the crisis of liberal democracy. Instead of obsessing about how democracies die, it might prove more useful to explore what keeps them alive. How shall we best conceptualize the cultural and social foundations of democracy? In the post-war German context, the most influential thinker to highlight this nexus is Ernst Wolfgang Böckenförde. The legal theorist famously noted that, quote, the liberal secular state lives on premises that it cannot itself guarantee. A similar concern about secularism and its discontents is central to Charles Taylor's idea of the social imaginary. A democracy, my fellow Montrealer has argued, is in need of some form of moral consensus that is based not on abstract Rawlsian reasoning, but on lived experiences social imaginaries, in other words. These social imaginaries allow citizens to embrace democratic principles such as solidarity and equality. According to Taylor, the concept refers, quote, to the ways people imagine their social existence, how they fit together with others, how things go on between them, the expectations that are normally met, and the deeper normative notions and images that underlie these expectations. My aim here is to suggest why Birkenfurter's fears may prove exaggerated and why Taylor's emphasis on shared morality is more problematic than is usually assumed. Conversations about the role of forms, of style, and of manners for democracy as a way of life may contribute to a more nuanced and imaginative understanding of democratic foundations. Questions of form and style may help us in our attempts to square the multicultural circle and to navigate the tension between, between equality and difference. With this in mind, we can return to the question of democratic theory and revisit at once Birkenfurter's fears and Taylor's emphasis on a shared thick morality. To privilege forms over substance is to emphasize rules, manners, and conventions over shared values and an ethical consensus. If a generally pluralist liberalism is justified in putting moral incommensibilities first, the foundations of democracy cannot be found in the realm of ethics. A republican constitution as Immanuel Kant noted, would have to work not just for a nation of angels, but also for a nation of devils. It might therefore be more fruitful to focus less on the moral passions that citizens hold and instead analyze how they articulate their ethical sentiments and fears 
in public. If liberal democracy is as much a way of life as a system of government, it is short-sighted to focus on shared values and a common social imaginary. If we understand diversity as the inevitable effect of individual freedom, if we put moral incommensibilities and questions of cruelty at the heart of our understanding of democracy, we need to fret less about social imaginaries and instead explore forms, styles, and aesthetics that stimulate, sustain, and revive democracy as a way of life. An emphasis on democracy as a way of life need not lead us to focus on questions of morality then. Instead, it invites us to analyze questions of form. Those who view cultural homogeneity as a prerequisite for liberal democracy overlook the fact that a specifically democratic form of civic cohesion emerges not from harmony, but rather from discord. Our ability to accept moral dilemmas that we cannot solve, but only navigate, our capacity to grasp what we cannot understand, presupposes forms and conventions, rules and procedures that allow us to live with deep diversity. Reflections on ways of life, questions of style and democratic spaces allow us to hone our feel for the cultural and social foundations of democracy. No matter how stable a liberal democratic government and a constitutional order may seem, it will wither and perish without ways of life that encourage democratic experiences. If liberal democracy requires that citizens also cultivate a democratic ethos, this presupposes a democratic commons, that is, cultural forms and social spaces that offer everyone the chance to experience freedom and equality in everyday life in a sensorial way. In short, to explore democracy as a way of life is to focus less on how democracy works, but on what democracy feels like. A democratic way of life does not emerge out of thin air. It presupposes a democratic commons, that spaces that allow for democratic experiences and everyday encounters. These include public squares and streets, public parks and swimming pools, municipal libraries and museums, kindergartens and playgrounds, youth centers and sports facilities, school, and perhaps even universities. In other words, places that not only serve the greening of the city, transportation or education, but above all invite people to stay and offer a stage for democratic participation. Together, these public spaces, places and public goods embody the idea of the common good. They create the framework that allows citizens to cultivate cultivate a democratic ethos. Democracy thrives on opposition, struggle, and discord. But these conflicts reveal their creative potential only if we preserve the democratic commons in which we can navigate conflicts and accept ambiguities. The more apparent the crisis of democracy is, the more evident it becomes how costly it is to cut the budget of those institutions and to neglect the public spaces and places that allow for democratic experiences and a deep pluralism. The infirmity of the democratic commons, therefore, is a threat to liberal democracy, first as a way of life, then also as a system of government. A democracy that no longer preserves these public goods and cultivates democratic ways of life puts at peril its social and cultural foundations. If we obsess about efficiency and performance, controlling and benchmarking in the public sphere and privatize public goods because the invisible hand of the market leads to supposedly fairer solutions, we lose our keen sense of democracy as a way of life. Especially in cities, it becomes apparent the leaner 
the more efficient the state, the more liberal democracy is endangered. Democracy as a system of government, but above all as a way of life, costs money. And without a strong, effective tax state, it is impossible to sustain it. More than other forms of rule, democracy needs spaces for democratic experiences, forums for and forms of civic discord. However, however inefficient these forms and spaces may be, if we do not want to give up the spaces of democratic experiences that enable us to fill the idea of a society of free and equal citizens with life and meaning, and this is where I will end, we can no longer afford the withering of our democratic commons and the loss of public goods. Without them, democracy hangs in the air. It will wither and die. It is for us to keep it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Till. That really kicked off <laughs> the discussion in an amazing way. Thank you so much. Um, so without further ado, I will um, hand over to Elias. Elias, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to discuss this really enormously fascinating and also very timely book in this forum. And right now, actually, I cannot see our author, but I will still from time to time address you directly. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from this book, and I think um, a large audience really will, will profit from reading it. Um, I find it very refreshing to think alongside the author about Oh, thank you very much. Now I can actually see you. That is much better. Thank you. I find it very refreshing to think about um, alongside the author about what keeps democracy alive while subjecting the sort of conventional success story of liberal democracy to renewed scrutiny. And I found it especially interesting how you managed to demonstrate the importance of the private, of gender relations, of family life and education to democracy. Indeed, you managed to convince your readers, I think, um, that it makes sense to think of democracy not merely as a form of government, but as a way of life. I found it very striking in one of the later chapters, um, the idea that democracy starts on the playground. And to me, that seemed to make a lot of sense in the context in which you present it. So I found this a really fruitful um, and a truly historical conception and way of thinking about democracy, um, avoiding teleology and really um, emphasizing the open-ended and fragile nature of democracy. Um, in the book, this is also several times referred to as, an, as a great experiment, and I think that captures it very well. As we've also just heard, the emphasis is on form rather than norm and on the necessity to live with conflicts, um, which again, I find very convincing. And I think that brings um, fresh material also to ongoing discussions about democracy. Um, but re repeatedly, you also referred to democracy as improbable. And I wanted to ask you about this choice of vocabulary. I think it is very understandable, especially in the context of post-war Germany. I mean, who would have thought that out of the Third Reich, you could actually build a, a somewhat stable democracy. Um, but it seemed to me that your statement um, actually was more general and was meant to go beyond the German context. And I wondered whether it implied something like a judgment about human nature or the human condition as such. And I would find it fascinating if you could say more about this. The book also offers a lot methodologically and um, employs really a number of diverse approaches throughout the various chapters. It takes new perspectives and I'm thinking, for instance, of the second chapter, um, which takes a perspective of moral history and emphasizes feelings over reason. As a whole, I found it very well narrated and your use of many striking quotations very effective. For instance, we encounter letters and travelogues, but the main type of source seems to me to be contributions to rather minor periodicals, such as the infamous Tabak Zeitschrift, Haus und Heim, Frau und Mutter, and so on. And I'm extremely sympathetic 
to this approach. But of course, one may also ask, I think, how representative such outlets really were. And I was hoping that um, today we might gain a glimpse backstage, so to say. Um, so I would ask you to explain your procedure a little bit. Did you follow particular authors or how did you locate these um, pertinent contributions? In a word, how did you select your sources? I also wanted to ask you to say something about the world beyond the Federal Republic. Um, the most obvious point of comparison, if we stay in the 20th century, um, is probably the GDR, to which you sometimes allude, and which certainly looms large at the back of um, probably all of your German readers' minds. Um, on the other hand, given your personal background, I wondered um, if it was fair to ask in how far living in Canada might have impacted your perception. And finally, um, I wanted to raise the issue of COVID-19. And of course, this goes beyond the immediate remit of your book. Um, but since it speaks to very present concerns, and since we find ourselves discussing the book in a forum dedicated to democracy in the 21st century, I wanted to address it. Obviously, the pandemic has exacerbated social rifts and put new fuel into lingering generational conflicts. At the same time, it has had a devastating effect on the access and use of the very public spaces you defend so vigorously as a stage for social and political participation. And just before the session, I took a walk outside and I, I was reminded how um, playgrounds were actually in the beginning of the pandemic sealed off and many um, public institutions still remain closed. Um, and since the book ends with the plea to cultivate such very spaces, which enable us to experience and live democracy, I wanted to ask whether you saw any alternatives to them. To say this a bit more tongue in cheek and if hypothetical, hypothetical questions are at all permitted, I wanted to ask if you were finishing the book right now, how would you? Thank you very much. And I hand over to Carol, I think. Yes. Hello, um, everyone in front of the screen, but also especially in, in Florence. And yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And thanks, Till, for this um, really great book. I must say that I very much enjoyed reading it. And um, yeah, it spoke to me, I would say, on a professional level for my research, but also more personally as a, as a German citizen. And um, yeah, I really thought that the book is especially relevant at this point in time in in Germany considering, I don't know, that somehow a change is in the air, not only because of uh, the end of Angela Merkel's chancellorship. And I think it's a good moment, um, yeah, Germany, but also I would say generally to reflect um, on, on democracy. Um, and I think also, especially for, for, the, for the younger generation, I think the, the book can really also serve as an inspiration or also as a as a good source to um to see a bit where we're coming from and um yeah i really um appreciate this um and what i also find very positive about the book that it kind of especially it it, it uh, was uh, not illuminating but like it was refreshing for me as a lawyer to to also realize, okay, democracy is not only the, the basic law and the parliament, but also, for example, um, yeah, education is re very relevant for this. Um, I found this, this interesting. And um, it also made me reflect a lot about the, the, the legal education in Germany. I must say you didn't mention it, but I think at some, some part um, you said that um, an authoritative education style, or you, you quote, that an authoritative education style leads uh, to existential fears and that therefore forces children to adapt. And I mean, wouldn't say that the German legal education is authoritative, but um, I would say, and there's also been a lot of criticism uh, during the pandemic um, that maybe the German state was not very able to also think ahead and to create. And I mean, as a matter of fact, many um, civil servants are lawyers and there have been calls, for example, to, to also reform the legal education, which, which is very much directed at yeah, avoiding mistakes and um, to kind of, yeah, kind of 
uh, find your way within the system and not so much uh, think ahead. Um, um, what I moreover very much um, yeah, found, appreciated or found super interesting is that you um, included external perspectives um, to describe post-war uh, Germany. Um, and I must say, I don't know how the other fellow Germans feel who lived abroad for a while. I think this view from the outside is super helpful to, to reflect um, on the German state already now, uh, also now, um, because yeah, from my own experience after living in Italy for two and a half years, I, I have a different view on the German legal system, the German society, and um, yeah, also on my on my personal history. So I think this this perspective was was super interesting. Um, I'm uh, myself writing uh, my PhD on the German abortion law and especially the 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 role of the German constitutional law and the court. Um, in the, the reform processes in the 1970s and 1990s, but also today. So the chapter um, on, on morality in, in, in Germany was very interesting for me and that you referred to uh, Fred, for example. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm personally thinking uh, about the German constitutional order as an order of values a lot and how up to date this, this uh, concept still is, and you already mentioned um, also in your introduction now that you yeah, would appreciate a society more that accept moral dilemmas and doesn't have the aim um, to, to kind of morally educate um, the society. Um, and therefore, yeah, I was wondering, you, 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 you highlighted or you, you said that you would like to um, like focus on forms. And do you also kind of refer to institutional decision-making with this? So do you, do you, would you say that, um, for example, the, the constitutional court or the constitutional law is an appropriate uh, means to, to make moral decisions? Or would you say there are more, um, more appropriate ways? Um, and Elias already mentioned the um, the um, yeah the kind of that you are, personally I was wondering why you didn't include a chapter on uh, democracy during the unification and um, yeah or the United Germany because for me like if I think about German democracy today I think what is essential. Um, is to also consider like yeah, East German perspectives. And um, therefore I would have wished for also the inclusions for them a bit more uh, in the book, because I think as a German society, we still yeah, need, to, <laughs> need to learn from this. I have also a few anecdotes now from, uh, from my time here in Berlin, for example, there's uh, um, the aim or there are like, the, they collect sig signatures for uh, expropriating a huge company that owns a lot of flats. And uh, a friend of mine was collecting signatures for this. And for example, he was attacked by a former citizen of the GDR who said, ah, ah, you cannot do this. And he was completely, um, completely um, surprised by this. And I think this is also due to the fact that within the German society, there's not enough communication about, about this time and not enough exchange. So yeah, maybe. Um, you could um, talk a bit more about this. Um, and then um, one other aspect that was um, interesting for me, and I'm, I'm not a historian and therefore I'm not so much aware of, okay, how much distance do you need to a certain time to actually um, evaluate it? Um, and you said that you were curious about what uh, the younger generation would write about the, the 80s in Germany. And um, yeah, in this regard, I was also um, wondering about 
yeah, memory politics, and maybe that's also something we can discuss in the bigger audience, how kind of us who are more distant from uh, the past now could kind of rethink um, German memory politics in, in regards to the Nazi regimes, but the regime, but also the GDI. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, we're having a little bit of problems with the sound and so on, so, so um, Till had to move. Um, so what we're gonna do now, we're actually going back into the, uh, into the in-person. Um, and so the, the camera will go by, by necessity onto Tomaso. Uh, so don't be disconcerted. Um, and uh, Tomaso, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Professor Van Raden, for your uh, introductory remarks, as well as for your book, which I greatly enjoyed. Speaking as an early career uh, scholar whose research interests lie at the intersection of political, economic, and intellectual history, I found your monograph extremely uh, intriguing as it encouraged me to deepen my knowledge of West German culture and critically revisit other well-established interpretations of post-war democratization across Western Europe. The book provides compelling evidence of the fact that coming to grips with democratic stabilization and consolidation requires a wide-ranging analysis of the channels through which the ethos of democracy can permeate the lives of ordinary people. Those citizens whose allegiance democratic systems ultimately hinge on. This moving beyond the examination of not only the machinery of the nation state with its institutions, uh, legal framework, and decision-making procedures, but also of the political process now defined in order to grasp underlying, sometimes silent, yet far-reaching social transformations as the ones addressed in the book. In that regard, from a methodological standpoint, uh, this monograph can serve uh, as a healthy uh, reminder of the inherent shortcomings of what uh, Professor Martin Conway in his recent Western Europe's democratic age called an architectural uh, approach to the study of post-war regimes, which tends to overlook the degree to which the social textures embedding those regimes contributed to the maintenance um, of its structures uh, over uh, time. I would like to invite uh, Professor Van Harden to expand on a couple of issues that sparked my curiosity uh, while reading his book. Issues he did not tackle head on, but uh, which could help me and perhaps help other readers as well, uh, better appreciate his perspective on post-war German history. The first is the extent to which his findings may lead to reconsider the orthodox periodization of the post-war period in which 1968 usually marks a, a watershed moment. To be sure, as the author points out, the contestation of parental authority in the late 1960s was much more radical than previous efforts aimed at making family relationships more egalitarian. 
And yet, one gets the impression that even those profoundly anti-hierarchical stances were somehow grounded in previous patterns of behavior and rapidly evolving social attitudes. In particular, the late 1950s come across as more dynamic and quite frankly, more interesting years than in many other accounts I'm familiar with, in which the highly popular uh, 1957 CDU electoral slogan, Kein Experimenta, too easily becomes a, a shorthand for the staunch social conservatism that supposedly characterized the Adenauer era. Here, the picture offered is definitely more nuanced. And I do wonder whether this might have any implications for how we think about continuity, discontinuity, and ruptures since 1945, at least with reference to the West German experience. The second issue I am touching upon is the role of consumerism in Professor Van Raden's story. There is an extensive body of scholarship, especially in the Anglophone world, that connects quite straightforwardly, and perhaps too straightforwardly, uh, the political and economic recovery of West Germany to the adoption of free market capitalism. Due either to a selective yet widespread reception of the American model centered on the consumer citizen, or the emergence of uh, an indigenous model of self-restrained uh, social market economy, which all mainstream parties more or less enthusiastically eventually came to embrace. As Konrad Jalausch and Michael Geier put it, uh, for example, and I quote, Germany was actually the perfect breeding ground for consumer democracy. Consumer society was ushered in as a way of rebuilding society in the wake of the war, making West Germany more dependent on consumerism in providing meaning and orientation than almost any other nation." End of quote. And surprisingly, this reading of West German history waves democratization, Westbindung, and the Cold War into a single narrative. As we all know, uh, in sharp contrast to the highly regimented, comparatively poor East Germany, so the narrative goes, uh, West Germany could reap the rewards of the Marshall Plan, enjoy a strong and stable currency, and benefit from non-confrontational industrial relations, all factors that strengthen the foundations of the Bonn Republic, ensuring its astonishing economic and political success. Nevertheless, consumerism does not feature in Professor Van Raden's investigation, uh, whereas, as we have heard, the final chapter highlights a critical consequence of the unfettered expansion of the market, uh, namely the erosion of public spaces and the detrimental impact of this phenomenon on local communities, as well as on democracy uh, more broadly. Again, I would like to ask whether this omission is a matter of focus, as it might be, or whether the monograph is also intended uh, to challenge, uh, albeit indirectly, uh, a view that has become more and more entrenched into the relevant literature. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and congratulations, Professor, on your book. Thank you very much, um, Tommaso. And um, last but not least, Benno, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lucy. Uh, thanks, Till, for um, this book, which was a wonderful read. Um, it's great to see you again. I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be with you in person there at, at Florence today.
Um, and I'm, I'm sorry for um, adding three more points to your impossibly long list of questions and comments. Um, but I, I really wanted to start by saying that I like your German. I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to write so lively and so engaging in German. Um, and I, it's, it's just such a pleasure to see that it's actually possible. You can write kind of great short books um, that are to the point and that are uh, a great pleasure to read in German. So um, that was the first half point I wanted to make. Um, the, the first kind of, um, in terms of contents, what I want you to talk about is uh, memory politics, um, uh, an issue that uh, Caroline already touched on. Um, in light of your idea that, you know, um, democracy rests on diversity and conflict rather than on homogeneity and identity, which I also, uh, you know, uh, an argument I really share. Um, but I was wondering whether one could kind of um, map that onto memory politics and the history of commemoration, commemorative strategies um, in West Germany um, as well. Of course, there is the big conflict um, when people wanted or started to talk about the Nazi past and the conflicts they engaged um, in with um, people who wanted to continue the silence. But I was also um, thinking about more recent conflicts um, about um, different groups of victims of the Nazi um, persecution, um, you know, kind of when homosexual victims came into the picture, the conflicts between gay and lesbian victims, Sinti and Roma, all these different groups. Um, but then also kind of the discussion that is ongoing about um, Germans with a migration background and how they can relate to um, the German past. Um, and all these kind of conflicts in terms of memory have been described as multi-directional memory, multi-directional um, politics of commemoration. And I was, um, I just wanted to, to hear what you would think about the idea that these conflicts are actually good for um, continuing a democratic way of life, because memory is not just a thing that is repeated and it always stays the same, but it's permanently contested and maybe this contestation of memory is, is even more um, obvious in Germany um, across the last 20 years than it used to be before. Um, so that was my first point. The second one um, is about uh, emotions. As, as our paths crossed, I think, for the first time till at the Center for the History of Emotions in Berlin, like 10 years ago, maybe, um, where we talked a lot about politics and emotion in politics and what is the right mix of rationality and emotionality when it comes to a democratic um, way of life, mode of living? Um, and I think you touch on that in the book when you write about politesse. Um, other emotions um, you, you mention is kind of the curiosity that kind of, you yeah, have, um, real Democrats, deep Democrats should have for everything that is strange and that they don't know. Um, you also um, mentioned passions, political passions. So I was, I was wondering whether you uh, wanted to say a little bit more about the kind of rationality, emotionality mix when it comes to the democratic way of life um, and, and how those political passions play out in that respect. And the third and last point I wanted to make obviously is about gender and family and the Kinderladenbewegung and, and all those wonderful things where I think it really, you know, kind of the change in um, images of fatherhood, um, where it really becomes very clear what you mean when you talk about democracy as a way of life. Um, and I was, I was wondering, I find it very convincing that you um, talk about how patriarchal authority um, was already challenged and critiqued long before 1968. Um, already since the 1950s, but still, you know, when kind of people started to talk about authority that is based in trust rather than hierarchy. Um, but then um, still there is kind of a further step that then comes with 1968 and the anti-authoritarian idea um, of, of getting rid of authority altogether, right? Um, the fathers are still there, but they don't have any hierarchical authority anymore. Um, and I was, I was wondering about what happens after that, because that, that kind of um, rather radical 
anti-authoritarian spirit in terms of education is challenged at some point, right? I would say from the 90s onwards, you hear pedagogues more and more saying children need to have limits. There need to be clear cut rules. You do not impose them with violence and force, but you stick to them, right? You have to be um, consequent would be the German word um, in education. Um, so there is, um, you know, it's, it's not that the old model of authority comes back, but there is kind of um, a, a certain rethinking and the, the radically anti-authoritarian idea. Um, um, people depart from that more and more. And I, I was wondering what that means in terms of gender, right? I'm, I'm completely convinced, as you say, that kind of there's more and more equality in private relationships. People try to get beyond the couple, beyond marriage. They try to experiment with alternative forms of life um, where kind of equality between men and women and all people involved is absolutely crucial. Um, but is there also, in that respect, is there a moment maybe since the 19, late 80s, 1990s, where um, people do not return to hierarchical gender relationships, but they return to an understanding of gender relations where there is equality, but there is also difference, if that makes sense, right? Where, where that kind of radical moment of equality um, is, not, is kind of... No, yeah, it, it changes again, and there's a more nuanced understanding, shall we say, of gender relationships um, that, that um, depart um, from that radical, absolutely non-hierarchical kind of thinking um, that was so influential, uh, particularly in the 1970s. So that's my third point, kind of how do you kind of um, think about and describe that after history, after the anti-authoritarian moment, um, especially in terms of gender. And, and, and that's, that's my five cents. Um, and now I very much look forward to hear what you have to say about all that. And of course, I also look forward to, to hear what all the other people in the room um, want to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benno. Thank you all very much for some amazing comments. Um, you've got, you know, five minutes. <laughs> Um, no, take your time, but obviously the, uh, we need to leave a bit of room for questions. That's an awful lot of interesting questions and comments that people have thrown at you. So yeah, we look forward to hearing your responses. So I, I tried to keep it to uh, five minutes. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful um, for these thoughtful, helpful suggestions comments, criticism. Can I just start with, with the question of, of style and writing? Uh, and it goes back to, to a lunch conversation I had with, with Nicola. Um, why is it that so much German academic prose is unreadable after 1945? And it actually has a lot to do with the 20th century and the destruction of an intellectual culture that flourished in Germany and German-speaking Central Europe between the mid 19th century and the early 1930s. And the one person that embodies that culture is Siegfried Krakauer, who's an incredible inspiration for me and is a kind of, and his spirit is all over the book. And one of the reasons why I at least attempted to write in a readable fashion is my admiration for Siegfried Krakauer, not just as a thinker, uh, but as a writer. Um, so, so perhaps in this in this spirit, let me begin with the, the question of of, um, of 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 memory. Um, now, one very simplistic way of of addressing the issue would be to say there are those Germans with a migration background, as we as the German public likes to say, and then there are those Germans uh, with a Nazi background. But of course, that that distinction is much too simplistic. Um, because the, the, the conversations and struggles over the meaning of Nazism um, that begin in 1945 and continue until today are already polyphonic and contradictory before you have 
new voices of people who articulate a different, perhaps even post-colonial perspective. Um, so, so, so I would assume that, that the, the polyphonic element of these conversations and struggles is something that marks the memory of Nazism from, from the get-go. Um, so one of the things that I find striking about the conversations that we often have, that we have about the memory of Nazism and the Holocaust is that it's one of the few areas of scholarship that continues to be Whiggish. So everything in the past is problematic. Everything we do today is in a sense infinitely better as, 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 as a kind of politics of memory. And it loses sight of the fact that our way of thinking about Nazism thinking about genocide, thinking about genocidal warfare may look as strange and bizarre to future generations of scholars and intellectuals as they articulate a different and another conception of a politics of memory. So one of the things that I try to highlight in the book is that conversations about Nazism and genocide in the 1950s, early 1960s, were not necessarily more subtle, but are worth rescuing from the condescension of posteriority that so, that so often informs these, the, the, a historiography of, of, of memory, that sort of memory studies. Um, so how, that having said that, the first thing is that the, the rupture with civilization, that something has happened that should have never happened, is something that marks these conversations from the immediate post-war years until today. To take a very banal example, in the case of post-war Germany, it would be impossible to air a television series like Black Adder that assumes in the case of Britain, in case you're not familiar with Black Adder, that there are these sort of unquestionable national traditions. There is a sort of mystic cord of memory or there are mystic cords of memory that connect Britain today with medieval England. That doesn't work in the context of post-war Germany anymore. The mystic cords of memory have snapped and everything is articulated against the background of this rap rupture. Um, the second thing then is that German nationalism, unless you're talking about the lunatic fringe, is always struggling with the fact that Germany is a haunted land. Germany is a land in the shadow of genocidal warfare and, 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 and genocide. And so, so this attempt to somehow come to grips with that, this very German fantasy of finally becoming normal again, of re-entering Western modernity as good normal uh, uh, liberal Democrats is, is something that, 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 that shapes these conversations. Um, and at the same time, the the, the intellectual and cultural devastations wreaked by the interwar and war years can still be felt wherever you turn, right? So if German-speaking Central Europe was one of the most exciting intellectual scholarly laboratories of modernity in the 20s, now the intellectual scene in Germany is bland in comparison. Right. And all of this is, is part of this very, how shall I say, um, um, is, is sort of very difficult to articulate, but, but omnipresent in, in, in some ways. Right. So what, what else shall I pick? Maybe the question of, of why, why democracy uh, is, is fragile. Now, Lucy was alluding to this at the very beginning. By fragile, I don't mean endangered. Uh, it's not an endangered species, but it's something that is inherently fragile. In a, in a sense, 
think of ourselves as inherently fragile. Our subjectivity is fragile. Uh, our sense of self is fragile. And if, 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 that's a, if that is the key argument or a way of looking at democracy, um, it, 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 it highlights various things. The first is think of Plato and the ship of state. The problem Plato identified is who gets to control the ship of state? What do you need to know in order to command a ship? Plato's answer was nautical skills. Ordin how can an ordinary citizen command a ship? A captain of the ship must have nautical skills. The answer in the context of democratic theory is, yes, there's expert knowledge, but democratic common sense is something very different. And it emerges out of public conversations, conflicts, strive, and it's not something that an individual person might have. Um, so, so that's the first thing, but it's, but it's, it, it's sort of, there's something very provocative in Plato's question that Democrats find difficult to answer. Um, the second is, if you think of a monarchy or an aristocracy, the source of legitimacy is evident. It is the divine rights of kings or the virtuous nature of our aristocrats. They are better than others. That's why they're called aristocrats. And what is the source of legitimacy in, in, in a democratic society? As Thomas Babington Macaulay put it, democracy is all sail, no anchor. So we are unmoored. And this is precisely the fact. The source of legitimacy is consent of the governed, voluntary consent of the governed, based on the idea of autonomy and maturity. But that's very, how shall I say this, elusive and less tangible than, let's say, the, the idea that there are divine rights of kings. And then finally, once you have a kind of public controversy among citizens, and this Rousseau was the first to point this out, what you have is the constant danger of controversies turning into civil war. And then you have a system of government that is inherently unstable and inherently fragile. And, and this, this is what makes the, the idea of writing or thinking about democracy generally, but also then writing the history of democracy so both intriguing and difficult to, to capture that inherent uh, fragility. I've gone on for, for far too long. So let me, let me just take um, one, one aspect because, because I think it, it sort of, uh, it, it, it sags into the, the whole question of the fragility, namely the question of the economy and consumerism. Um, and Obviously, there's no way of understanding the post-war moment without acknowledging the economic miracle, without acknowledging what the Germans called the Fresswelle, the fact that people were suddenly who had been starving for a few years now could, could eat whatever they wanted, um, uh, which is why it's not an eat Esswelle, but a Fresswelle. Um, and and the, the Marshall Plan, both as a, as a kind of reality of economic policy, but much more important as a kind of cultural, political fantasy that the Americans offer to post-war Europe. Uh, Cheryl Crone's work here, I think, is, is central. Um, and, and, then, and, and then this kind of um, um, sort of happy consumer citizen fantasy. That, that you find everywhere. But what, this, what an emphasis on consumerism cannot explain is how these post-war democracies, Germany, but as well as others, suddenly become more than fair weather democracies. So why is it that in, if in comparison to the interwar years, post-war European democracies, first in Western Europe and now also in Eastern Europe with all qualifications and Viktor Orban and whoever you, who, whoever you have as a kind of illiberal Democrat, 
emerging out of the post-1989 moment, in comparison to the interwar year, these liberal democracies have proved remarkably resilient. And the answer to me is less consumerism and consumer capitalism. Um, it may have been helpful, but the fact that people began to generally embrace democracy and a democratic ethos and democracy as a way of life. And one of the things that has happened since I think is a shift from a bounded capitalism, right? Um, where, where sort of capitalist market strategies were, could be found within the economy to, to sort of market societies where the, 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 the reasoning of a, a sort of market suddenly uh, invades all, all spheres of life. I mean, Michael Sandel, I think, is one of the most interesting commentators in, in that regard. But sort of it's unfettered, unbounded capitalism. Um, and so th that is a huge shift. And it's actually one of the things, as you pointed out, that, that I see as a genuine threat to liberal democracy. I think that populist parties are disturbing, unpleasant, but they're not an existential threat. Unfettered capitalism, and I actually am a big admirer of market economies, but unfettered capitalism is probably, as we speak, the greatest threat to our liberal democracies. I haven't answered everything, but maybe we can get to back some of the things later. <laughs>